Welcome everyone to my video about root locus. During this video, I will talk about root locus for discrete time systems. The root locus analysis is a graphical method for examining how the roots of a system change with variation in gain within a feedback system. This is a technique used as a stability criterion developed by Walter R. Evans in 1988 which can determine the stability of a system, which is crucial while designing a controller. The root locus method consists in plotting the zeros and poles of a transfer function. The zeros are the roots of the, de of the numerator, while the poles are the ones in the denominator. It denoted Q of Z are the zeros and P of Z are the poles. On the S plane, the continuous transfer function is stable if all the poles are on the left side of the imaginary axis. On the other hand, on the Z plane, the discrete time system is stable if the poles are located inside of the unit circle. So while working with systems in the Z domain, it is important to remember that the poles cannot go further than the boundaries of the unit circle. It is important to remember that a pole in a real axis means an exponential function behavior. If the pole is on the negative side, the exponential will decrease. And if it is on the positive side, it will increase. How far the pole is from the origin is related to how fast the exponential occurs. If the pole is on the imaginary axis, the function will behave in a sinusoidal manner. Having a pole on the positive axis means that its conjugate also appears and vice versa. If the pole are far away from the origin, means that the function will oscillate more. If the poles are between the real and imaginary axis, then the function will behave like a combination of exponential and sinusoidal, like the one we have here in the first quadrant, or in the second one, or third, or fourth. After plotting the zeros and poles, the root locus consists in connecting the poles with the zeros using lines called branches. This segment begins in a pole and ends in a zero, always. If there are more poles than zeros, the remaining branches from the poles will extend to infinity, as we can see in the image of the left. <clears throat> if there are more poles than... <clears throat> no, if there are more zeros than poles, uh, a branch that comes from infinity will arrive at the zeros are unpaired. So here in the right side, we have the, the branch that is coming from infinity, the zero. Is there, a, there are no enough poles in the system. These branches <clears throat> represent how the poles move along it when the gain of the system is changed. Understanding how a pole moves the type of function it produces is important because you can predict the behavior of a function and whether or not you need to move the poles to avoid instability due to external disturbances that may appear in the system. Other aspects to take into consideration are that if there are no zeros, the poles branches will collide and then they will go plus and minus infinity aligned to the imaginary axis as it is in here. Now, let's see an example. The following transfer function is given by, a, by the expression shown, where Q of Z is a numerator and P of Z the denominator. 
rearranging the terms, we get the loop false transfer function as in here, that is k of q of z over p of z, which is equal to q of z plus 0 0.8 times z minus 0 0.2 over z minus 1.2 to the power of 2 times z plus 1. The roots of q of z, which is a numerator, are called open loop zeros, while the roots of p of, p of z are called open loop poles. Let's open MATLAB to work in this exercise. So here I am in MATLAB. I create this little program. I define the variable z as the transfer function of z, which is a discrete time function. K is the gain of the system, which is one, just for this moment to, to show you the results. And then we're going to change it. We have the numerator, which are the zeros of the system, the denominator, that are the poles of the system, the transfer function, which is p over p, q over p, sorry, and the final function of the system, which is a feedback of the transfer function times the times the gain. And we have a one here, which is the function, which is 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 a gain of the feedback. So let's plot the R locus and see what we got. So this is the results. As you can see, we have three poles and two zeros. So the poles, this is a, this is, um, uh, is the in, in a stability in the system because the poles are outside the unit circle. As you can see, all three poles are outside. So uh, two of the poles are paired with these two zeros and this pole is alone, so it's moving to infinity. So we'll cover already covered that. So the important part in here is that the system is not stable. So to make the system stable, we need to adjust the gain or the value of k to make these poles follow this path. Remember that these branches are the path of the root locus of the, of the, of the poles, sorry, are the path of the poles when you change the gain. So let's change the gain to create a stable system. So let's see. Or with four, we already have a stable system, but the poles are close to the unit circle. So if we have like a disturbance from the from other, on our system of the, the environment, uh, this the system could be could be unstable again. So let's. Let's decrease the value a little bit, like six. Okay, that's okay. We can um, make the poles come closer if we can, if we want. But I leave it like that just for this exercise. So now we have these two poles inside the unit circle. So it's not a stable yet because because we already we have this other pole here. So what we can do is we can create a zero in the system to create a branch between this pole and another zero over here in, inside the unit circle. And with that branch, we can move the k the gain if necessary to make this pole move inside the unit circle. So let's try that. Mm, here in Q, because Q, remember, is the poles of the system. So we need a pole inside the unit circle. So instead, mm, let's say, say, set plus one, which is in the border of the unit circle, in the left border. 
Okay. Now you see the pole is exactly at the border of the gen circle. And basically we can put this pole in whichever part we want to make this system stable. So yeah, that's basically it. Maybe I can I can do better with this. Let's see like let's do minus. 0.2, maybe the poles will have uh, new branches with this pole. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we have another one in 0 0.2. So it's like 0 0.2 set minus 0 0.2 squared. So these here are two poles and the two, two zeros. And these two poles are converging in these zeros. And this one here is converging with the pole in set plus 0 0.8. So this system is now stable. We just have to move the, um, the gain and add a pole, to make it uh, stable. Last but not least, there are two more concepts uh, worth mentioning. The first one is about the angle of the asymptotes. This angle is calculated when we use the equation. Let me write it here. Oh my God. Okay. It's calculated when you use this, this equation B of Z over Q of Z equals minus K. This equation um, came from the came from the pulse transfer transfer function, which is this one. U of Z over P of Z equals zero. And also this is the same as P of Z plus K times Q offset equals zero. We we just solve for for minus k, that's all. So now uh, we know that P offset and Q offset are polynomials of of grade N and M respectively. So P offset we know is set of N plus A1 times Z and an uh, iteration before, which is N minus one. And this goes to A plus N since Z to the power of N minus N is zero and Z to the power of zero is one. And for Q of Z is basically the same, is Z to the power of M plus B1 the power of uh, times z to the power of m minus one times all the way to the n. So uh, when we have a large set, we can approximate this formula. Oh, sorry. We can approximate this formula as the following. Let me use blue. So we can approximate it as set of n over set of m equals minus k. And k, we know that k belongs to the integers numbers. So from here, we know that we can subtract the exponents. So let's do that. N minus M equals minus K. And taking an, the argument of both sides of the equation, give us N minus M times the argument of set 
that's equal to pi plus two times k pi. So now the direction of the asymptotes are given by this following expression, which is theta of the gain, which is k, is equal to the argument or the angle of z. And solving this expression right here, that gives us 2k plus 1 times p over n minus m, which n minus m is just the difference between poles and zeros. So that's that's the angle when we have asymptotes in the in the set plane with the root locus. So the second in important concept, let me move right here, is the asymptotes intersection with the real axis. So <clears throat> to calculate the intersection with the real axis, change colors again, we use the following formula. Set of I B is equal to the sum of P I, which P I are the starting points or the open loop poles beginning and in I equals to zero to N, which is the number, the total number of poles minus the sum of qi, which are the endpoints or the open loop zeros, beginning in i equal to zero to m, which are the total number of zeros, all that divided by the difference between poles and zeros. 